journey to the stars, space travelers, we are going to have a very special character and we are going to deal with mysterious and enigmatic topics such as the astronauts of the Bible and those astronauts who also visited ancestral communities. This character is very special. He has had a journalistic journey of more than 53 years. He has been in very important television programs. He has had programs such as Enigmas of the World, a very special program in Caracol Radio. He has also been in programs in Tele Antioquia, in Tele Medellin, and well, he is the writer of seven books, a person that for me is very special and very important. Let's give it away to the guest. travelers today on star travel we are going to have a very special guest but before announcing the guest I am going to tell you about the topics we are going to deal with what are the topics the astronauts of the Bible it is a very enigmatic very mysterious subject and a subject worth studying in these times where many UFOs where the Pentagon is investigating more seriously the subject of UFOs this person that we invite today to our program Journey to the Stars is a person who has been in journalism for 53 years. He is a writer of seven books. He has made programs such as Enigmas of the World in Caracol Radio, but he has also made countless programs in Televida, in Telemedellin, in Teleantioquia. Our very special character is Nestor Armando Alzate. Nestor Armando. Edison, thank you very Welcome much. Welcome to our program. Thank you for the invitation. A very cordial greeting to all the viewers. Yes, these topics are topics are not only fascinating, but they they lead one to ask oneself, what role do I play in the universe? What do I play here? Really, when one contemplates the sky, contemplates the stars, one says, I cannot be alone here. Starting from that point, all the other questions are already on the table. Nestor, uh, in the past, it was very difficult to talk about these issues. Now that the Pentagon, uh, Russia, China, for example, in Russia, there are UFO sighting contact groups supported by the government of more than a million people. We could say that there is already a general acceptance of the subject. But let's look at the themes of the Bible. On very ancient themes, we have the prophet Enoch. He is the first astronaut. What do you think about that, Nestor? The prophet Enoch is considered the first astronaut in history. He was a diluvian patriarch. He was the father of Methuselah. Methuselah, the father of Lamech. Lamech, the father of Enoch, of Noah. There is that saga. Then it is supposed that some special beings take him to outer space. And from there, he has the possibility of observing the Earth as if we were in a geostationary satellite. Then he says that he knows the root of the storms, the winds, the springs of the rivers. What he has to think is that from a meteorological satellite, he was able to observe as we see it daily when a hurricane is forming, he sees that cloud, he sees the whirlpools, that is what he saw. But apart from all that, he affirms that he was able to see how the celestial mechanics was how the sun rose from a house, understanding the house as a sign that lasts 30 days. And he says that for 30 days, it rises from this house and how the earth was making its course in its solar year around the sun, the two seasons, the 12, the 12 signs. And he tells that there are, that the year is 364 days, that the lunar years are 13 months. He counts the phases of the moon meticulously seven points, 53 each phase. So when you look at this and say, no, this guy had to have been on the outside. He couldn't have this knowledge any other way. Much more so if we think that at that time, the Enoch lived 365 years. His son, to say older than Matus Halein, lived 969 years. Mech lived more than 500 years and Noah also lived any number of years. One wonders what kind of measurement of years was made. What was the day like? 
whether it was the light period and the shadow period contemplated as 24 hours like today, or was it only the light period? But then that's where the contradiction comes in. If this guy talks about the year lasting 364 days, then one has to conclude, in effect, these people did have the genes necessary to last almost a millennium before the flood. Because when the flood came, everything changed. Enoch was a wonderful character and he did not die. He was caught up to the heavens. In the light of what all these sightings tell us today in the world today, what could be said to have happened to Enoch? What did he get caught up in? Was it an airship or? He was abducted by an extraterrestrial craft. But when we talk about extraterrestrial craft, I do not refer specifically to that type of vehicles that we see in space. A form of transportation that can be, now I can perfectly understand that it can be a beam of light, a laser that takes you, teleportation or just hologram, I don't know. But now I can understand it. At that time, I would have to talk about angels. It had to be God. It couldn't be conceived of any other way. There was no way. Nestor, let's talk about another very important character in the Bible, because we are talking about the astronauts, because those who traveled to heaven were astronauts. Moses. Moses was guided. What do the texts tell us? He was guided by clouds that were incandescent at night, the pillars of fire, the burning bush, he disappeared for 40 days. Man, Moses is a very strange character. It is that the origin of these characters, we don't know the father of Enoch. We don't know who his father was. Although it is spoken nominally, I don't remember. In this one, Bimelech, maybe, I don't know who his father was. But they are characters that, if you look at it throughout history, one says these characters and in different cultures, the characters that Moses, he was supposedly born of a Hebrew mother, but they found him in the Nile, in a basket, in a basket. One goes to Mithras and to Mithras the same thing happened. She appears in a basket. And all these characters, regularly, it is said that they were not the work of a mating. And I am speaking from biological terms between a man and a woman but always a supernatural being that inseminates a woman. Excuse me, Nestor, even many archeologists and writers in Egypt, I have been there touring, talk about Moses possibly going to Atenaton. Then look Probably. at the mysteries and enigmas that have been hidden from us from ancient times. Who does not say what the origin is, but I was telling you about Moses. I was telling you about Mithras, Noah. It turns out that when Lamech tells it in the book of Enoch, that when Lamech, at that time, well, obviously they had to carry the flocks as they were nomads, they were Bedouins, so they grazed their flocks by carrying them, looking for the territories where the best pastures were according to the climate. And then those were nine month, 10 month journeys. When he comes back after nine months, his wife with a child, and she says to him, no, no, I had no dealings with any man. She remembers with that language. Those were the children of God or it was God. And he stares at the child and says, ah, but is that this little boy? He doesn't look like any of us. Those eyes are incandescent. They are too beautiful, the biotype of him, because he did not say it this way. No, no, he's not one of us. This has to be a son of God. So Lamech goes and tells his father Methuselah. And Methuselah says, brother, I have no answer. Let's go to my father Enoch. And they go to Enoch and Enoch tells them, no, I know what the story is. The Most High told me that this child was his son and that you should accept him as your son because he is going to save the world. In other words, Enoch also has an unknown origin. In other words, there are a lot of characters that tell us where do they come from, why? And they are not, none of them is conceived on the ground. Nestor, now watching your program Logic, Nestor Armando Alzate, I invite you to visit his YouTube channel, Nestor Armando Alzate and Logic and Logic, you talk about the clouds in the sky. What are those clouds in the sky that guided the Israeli people led by the prophet Moses in the desert? For me, they are UFOs. E to support this and to have a clear idea, remember that in August of 1915, 
in the peninsula of Gallipoli in Turkey. A battalion, the Norfolk Battalion. Some say there were 800 of them. Others estimate that there were 2,000 because you had to include all the servants plus the animals they were carrying, supplies, plus those of the transport. They were walking through a ravine. They were going towards a place, the 60th elevation, a hill over there. And it turns out that walking along that gully, suddenly a huge cloud descends and gets low to the ground. And here are some New Zealand soldiers, a New Zealand contingent that was on another hill here watching the scene already, sees them all going into the cloud. 800 or 2,000, well, the number here, I don't think it matters so much. They all entered the cloud. When the last one entered the cloud, the cloud was rising. Joined another pile, another cloud formation that was there at a certain height. And suddenly they all disappeared at a great speed. And the battalion, nowhere. If we take this cloud as a reference, we can already understand that throughout the whole story, that they are a technology that we don't understand today. History, the cloud is an object of life. And when I say extraterrestrial, although when I talk about extraterrestrial, I'm also left with the question mark. To what extent it can also be that what we suppose to be of extraterrestrial origin is nothing more than the passage from one dimension to another. Or why not a ship from the future that manages to travel in time and arrives there? Or interdimensional portals, there has also been a lot of talk portals, on that subject. Exactly. In any case, it is something that human beings cannot understand and cannot handle. Those clouds, particularly the ones in the Bible, Observe that when Moses goes out with his people, the first thing the cloud does Moses goes is that out the cloud supports people. him when he the goes out. The first thing the cloud does is that the cloud supports him when they go to the Red Sea. And it defends all the people because when the army goes in, she opens the way for Pharaoh's army to pass. She immediately is the one that closes the sea to finish with that army. And then that cloud accompanies him and the people with the condition that this cloud in the daytime had a form of tabacada and went ahead as a guide for the people. And where the cloud stopped, there they had to set up camp. But the cloud was always outside the camp, far away. And at night, that cloud became a column of flame. It would stand vertically, it would become a column of flame, and it would illuminate the whole camp. Well, if there is no intelligence behind it, God can do whatever he wants, yes. But God can make use of many means. He had to do it that way. Nestor, there is another character that worries me a lot, and we have been asked a lot about the prophet Elijah. He was caught up in a chariot of fire to heaven, and an eyewitness his disciple Elisha. A chariot of fire, well, in ancient times, the term spacecraft or airplane or helicopter or UFO was not used. Nor UAPIS, which is the new term used by the Pentagon to refer to UFOs. I can no longer understand what that acronym means. That, then what does unexplained aerial phenomena mean? That is the term, the acronym. More euphemism. It is more euphemism or to continue covering up the subject. But Nestor, what was that chariot of fire? Many people asked us, a chariot winged by horses towards the sky, like a horse was flying. In short... What happened is that I had to use allegorical figures. Obviously that an individual or a society of that, that antiquity, as happens in any society, in order to be able to describe something has to have as reference its landscape and its space. Let me give you an example. When the missionaries went to evangelize the Inuit in Alaska, they were told that Jesus had been born in a manger between an ox and a donkey. They said it was an ox, it was a donkey. They had to be told that between a reindeer and an anta, for example. 
because that is what they know in their space. So each society defines according to what it can contextualize. So that's why they talk about fire ships. They talk about the glory of God. The cloud, for example, that accompanies the shepherds guiding them to the manger where the child God is when he comes and tells the shepherds, pass over the earth, men of goodwill. Today, a king is born to you, which is the announcement of the birth of Jesus. The cloud, which they define as the glory of God, they say it in the gospel, comes here. So it's cloud, it's ship, to what is most done in the modern era when Kenneth Arnold. In Mount Rainier, Washington, 1945, 1947, he was flying over that mountain and he saw this UFO formation. What did he think to say? That they looked like two inverted saucers, like when your mother served you a meal and you didn't get home, she covered it with another plate. How could he define it? A flying saucer, that's what they did. To scale is what they did with what they knew. Nestor, we are going to make a commercial break and we are going to continue talking about these very interesting programs with Nestor Armando Alzate. Continue with our program of Travel to the Stars with a very special guest, Nestor Armando. Alzate, with a very enigmatic, mysterious topic about the biblical astronauts, and we will continue with another character. And we are going to continue with another character. Nestor is a character that particularly calls my attention, which is Jacob. When he fought against the angel, who was that angel? Well, we have been taught that angels are extracorporeal beings. Who was that angel that Jacob wrestled with? The problem with Jacob was that son of Isaac, Isaac, son of Abraham. And God had promised Abraham that his descendants would be like the stars. And so Ishmael and Jacob were born. Ishmael, father of the Arabs. Ishmael, father of the Arabs, and Isaac, father of the Jewish people. Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Esau is, they are twins, but at that time, the one born last was supposed to be the, was supposed to be the eldest. The eldest was Esau. The mother loved Jacob more and made a pantomime so that Jacob would be the one to receive the birthright. He was hairless and Esau was very hairy. When Isaac was already old, he was blind. He had to give him the blessing. They sent Esau to go and get married. They said to Jacob, come here. They put a skin of a goat on him. And the little old man came and touched him and said, yes, this is Esau. He gave him the blessing and declared him the firstborn. Earlier, he had been legitimized because Esau came in very hungry one time. And then Jacob proposed to him, I mean, I'll give you a dish of lentils that I was cooking if you give me the birthright. He was so hungry that he said, let him do it. With that, he legitimized him. But when Esau realized what was happening, he was so angry that he wanted to kill Jacob. That he wanted to kill Jacob, he had to flee. And he fled and fled and fled and fled and fled and there came a time when night came. He was overcome with weariness and lay down. And he lay down and put his head on a stone. He began to dream. And there was a stairway to heaven. Angels were ascending and descending. And in those angels also appeared the angel against whom he had to fight. Some want to see from a psychological or psychoanalytical perspective that he is fighting with Esau in dreams. And that is when, after sunrise, he understands that he is in God's territory and God speaks to him and says, your descendants will be like the stars, like the sand of the desert, and I will bless you and I will protect you from everything. And that's why he also considers him the father of the Jewish people. But that struggle is also an allegorical way of making him understand that leadership is won by fighting. It is not won simply because I give it to you, but you have to show your worth. One way also I believe of that deity that I think, to put it in a very colloquial way, wanted him to measure the oil. And he passed the test. 
That is why that fight appears, but a fight that legitimizes his condition of father of the people of Israel. But before we go to the break, what a pity I forgot to tell you. You asked about Elijah, I don't know. Prophet Elias. Yes. Time passed. The prophet Elijah is one of the most important prophets. Some go so far as to say that it was because there was a side of Judaism that believed in reincarnation and another side did not. Some see the reincarnation of Moses, understanding that Moses died some 900 years or 1,000 years before, before, no, much more, at least 1,400, 1,500 years before Christ. And then it is assumed that Elijah is the reincarnation of him. Look, they are very special beings. Moses, a guy who had, who had a stutter. The one who had to interpret him was Aaron, his brother, because he was a stutterer and he couldn't make a speech. But with all that he had such a special condition that you could almost say it was an initiation process. 40 years living in Egypt. 40 years in the desert fleeing. And when he was 80 years old, he called God and told him to lead my people to died of 120 years. How was that evolutionary process? From there, it is assumed that Elijah takes up Moses and appears again in the Old Testament at a crucial moment in the history of that people. And Elijah, a favor of God, also listens to God as Moses hears him that God speaks directly to Elijah as well. And it is in the Avalia that God raptures him, takes him away in a chariot of fire. Chariot of fire? Well, that's a figure of speech. I think they saw a wagon moving where they were carrying animal drawn things. The shape doesn't matter. What matters is that it's a transport. What do you call it? Well, fire wagon. He takes him, but if you say fire wagon, it's because somehow that object he's riding on has nozzles on which flames come out. It has an engine, the exhauster of a chariot. But here you see the flames as it is when they lift a rocket with a satellite. You see the flames, what they call the nozzles. Those flames come out of the nozzles. How else could you define it chariot of fire? And then look at those two characters. And the blessed cloud reappears in the transfiguration of Jesus. Even they look like Elijah and Moses talking to Jesus. Radiant beings. J.J. Benitez in the book El Enviado describes it in a marvelous way. That presence of the two radiant beings, refulgent, speaking with Jesus, and at the same time he also becomes radiant, and suddenly a cloud. They were beings, Nestor, that one was taken away by a chariot of fire to the prophet Elias, and Moses never appeared body. Moses' body did not appear, but it says, Deuteronomy says, that he was buried directly by God. That only God knows the place where he was buried. A God who takes the trouble to go and bury someone? What kind of God is that? If he is not a corporeal being with feelings, then explain to me what. But in the letter of Jude, which is the penultimate book of the New Testament, because then follows the apocalypse, he states that when Moses died, there was a confrontation between the devil and the archangel Michael for possession of the body. If these two fought, then it makes sense that God, or that the archangel Michael would have been the representation of God, takes the body and carries it away. Nestor, from time immemorial, we have been told of these struggles between good and evil. There is a reference in the book of Noch, even in the Bible in Genesis, where it speaks of 200 angels who ascended Mount Jermo, commanded by a kind of Asacelos in Yasa, what is it? Happened with these angels that began to be with the women of the men of the planet Earth. They fell with the fall. There is an eternal struggle between angels, demons, Look at all mythologies. In all mythologies, there is always a good God and an evil God. And there is always a confrontation between them. Krishna with, what was he called? Arjuna, with Arjuna. Although Arjuna was one of Krishna's heroes, I think it was another one. Well, anyway, there they are. Among the Vikings, Thor and Loki. 
among the Greeks, Zeus and Nemesis, the goddess of evil. And so in all of them, Viracocha has to confront dark beings. In all of them, there is always this struggle of good with evil. And obviously that in the Old Testament, the rebellion of the fallen angels appears. There, in Lucifer's rebellion, J.J. Benitez talks a lot about it and tells that story. When we refer to the text of Enoch, in Genesis, let's say like I think chapter six, it talks about how the sons of the gods of Elohim, which means gods in plural, the sons of the gods mated with the daughters of men and the giants were born, who are then called the Nephilim. Well, according to what Enoch says, those giants, or rather those 200 who arrived here, who came with a specific mission to teach the human being the arts, metallurgy, the handling of fire, a little bit Promethean also, that Prometheus epic among the Greeks, to teach agriculture, to teach letters, to teach poetry, to teach makeup to women. It says it specifically there. That is to say, in short, that they had to come to try to civilize. Those, let's say, were already homo sapiens or hominids that were there. And it turns out that they are captivated by the beauty of those women. They fall into temptation and lose their status as angels. Because by becoming mortals, by being seized by the desire for the woman, they lost the possibility of handling everything from the spiritual perspective. That is to say that you could handle and manipulate matter as you wanted, shape it, do whatever you wanted. But when that happens, they lose that because they gave the possibility that these humans understand the concept of good and evil by eating the fruit of good and evil, which is mating. So they became equal to these, these equal to those. And these Nephilim are born then with all the passions, envy, meanness, selfishness, everything you want. E, as they were giants. And when they become with all those passions, they start to devastate the planet. Then they eat all the harvest because they were voracious, all the crops, the animals. And there comes a time when they are already devouring men. When that just happened, God splits blankets with them. And that is the crucial moment when they define to you the fight of Lusbil, the confrontation of Lusbil with God to become Lucifer. The fallen angels come. These 200 become fallen angels and their children, they already leave the wickedness of these and their children are in charge of executing that wickedness. And that is where they practically, they ravage the entire planet. And that's when God says, no, we have to shuffle and cast again. And then he decrees that there is a flood. That's when Noah Lamech appears. Noah, who was born of their children. And he says, you are going to save the earth. Well, look, Enoch, Methuselah Lamech Noah of strange origin too, is responsible for saving a little of the species and only his family, because you have to do away with all this remnant of evil. But those who are beings of light, who continue to be so, those 200, but already from the perspective of evil, with certain limitations, are still latent, but already prevailed by the hatred and rancor that the fact that God has set them aside has aroused in them. Then they remain present. And even after the end of the flood, and even after the end of the flood, when men become mortal with a life expectancy of 40, 50 years, they continue acting. And there, they are acting Nestor, so let's go to a commercial break. These topics are fascinating, Nestor. Thank you for being on this program. We are very happy and well. Let's go to a commercial break and continue with our program journey to the stars. We continue with a very special guest, Nestor Armando Alzate and Hiloy. A very special program today, the astronauts of the Bible. We have another character. Well, we were talking Nestor, 
about the subject of the 200 angels or what they call the angels of Cadiz, Cadiz angels or the rebellion of the Bethlehem in short. But there is another character in the Bible that we are passing from one character to another, Jonah the whale. Jonah was three days inside a whale and when he came back, he came back with a lot of knowledge. What was that whale? Because I could not think that they gave him, they dictated him a lot of knowledge inside a whale. But in today's light, we see objects very similar to that type of whale. What can you tell us, Nestor, about this subject? It is obvious he was simply abducted as well. He was abducted in the beginning, when God supposedly gives him the order to go. See, it's always the case that these prophets are very tragic in tone. And they are almost like Cassandra's heralds of misfortune. And it turns out that God tells him, hey, you have to go to Nineveh to convert these people to say that I am going to destroy this. He says, no, 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 not me. Don't tell me that story. And he refused 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 until then he tries to run away and the whale catches him. To begin with, even if the whale has a very big mouth, it's impossible for him to get away anyway. Besides, the biggest whales, the biggest cetaceans eat algae, microalgae. So the mouth is not made for that. It is evident that what happened there is that a UFO or well, an unidentified flying object or an object, it could be a UFO, an unidentified underwater object, a UFO, that picks it up and takes it away. And they do a lectioning process. They lection him, hey buddy, is that we need for this and this and this and this? And maybe once there, we would say that you can manipulate the brain in such a way that you inscribe him or induce a lot of knowledge, put it into his head. And so when he comes back, he comes back with the gift of the word. He comes back a wise guy, thanking God and not in any way frightened traumatized because he had been in the bosom of a whale. Here, what one can evidently perceive is that he was abducted and taken to a ship in which he was told that he had been abducted. To a ship where he was told that he must do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And with more knowledge of the cause, he was able to convince the people and save them and save them. Nestor Ezekiel's ship. We were investigating that a NASA scientist drew it. He drew the whole text, he drew the whole testimony of the prophet Ezekiel. And it looks like a flying saucer. This has made an impression on me. It gives the impression that it is also a helicopter. That causes me a lot of impression because when, look, when I was a child, Nestor, I remember, I heard a lot that if we read the Bible or sacred texts, we would go crazy. But I don't know if they are trying to cover up this issue now that, let's say, I became a researcher on this issue and that I have seen that they burned the Alexandria Library, many libraries in the world, maybe to cover up, and that the CIA in the year of the year of the year declassified more than 2,500,000 classified documents, among them many documents about UFOs and sightings. Well, I say, man, there is the answer of the prophet Ezekiel. I read the book of the prophet Ezekiel, excuse me, Nestor. And I find things that are of a ship that is of a flying artifact. Then he says, I saw the glory of God descending. God, the glory of God then. This program is very interesting, Travelers to the Stars. That's why, because from the sacred texts, from the texts of many cultures, there has been a lot of talk about this kind of artifacts or those angels or those beings, whether they have a body or not, but they have assisted mankind. But this ship, Ezekiel, Nesto, calls my attention. What do you think about it? What happens is that it is so evident, the description that he does of any person who no training, no preparation, nothing at all, but out of curiosity. And he is describing here a helicopter or a ship because the wheels do not change direction. They are like a cube. So they are wheels that are changing in any direction where he turns them and they do not change shape. 
we could almost say that it has inside a gyroscope, or gyroscope that keeps it stabilized where it turns, and that behind it, there are a number of eyes that are watching it, right? A lot of eyes. And that it obviously expels fire. And that resembles a little bit to what Enoch said when he describes that he was in a ship that looked and saw the vault of heaven, that he had it here in his head and saw it perfect. But he looked down and saw the earth, that it was a helicopter, a glass floor, a glass roof. But apart from that, I looked back and saw the fire coming out, the flames coming out of the nozzles. And so I saw those other beings there, 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 exactly the same as the one who. And so I saw those other beings there, 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 exactly the same as that one. Ezequiel lo que ve es un UFO. And I come back to my UFO story because even though that definition has been reevaluated, they still are. It is an unidentified flying object that regularly has been coined as a generic expression to say that it is an extraterrestrial, but in any case, it's an unidentified flying object. It's a craft that can fly. And that's what Ezekiel saw. And how else could you describe it? Just as he describes it. There is a subject, Nestor, that caused my attention with that ship. I have had the privilege, Nestor, to travel around the world, to travel to many countries, finding answers to a sighting I had in the year 99. And when I had that sighting, the first thing I said was an invention of my mind, a, let's say, I don't know. I yes, mean, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it because I saw an object very close, very close, emitting lights in the belly, in short, very big. I felt many things in the year 99, and I dedicated myself after the year 99 to travel to those places where it was said that there were in ancient times this type of visits, that there were, for example, as in Egypt, in the Davidos temple of Pharaoh Setuno, where there are some inscriptions on a lintel of UFOs, airplanes, helicopters. Then I dedicated myself to investigate as if to give strength to my sighting. It so happens that this program with its director, Ivan Obando, was made precisely for that because many people are afraid to talk about the subject, that is, when they have sightings, when they have experience and so on. But there is much, 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 much material to cut and a lot of country to investigate, many books to read on this subject to feel sure that it was not a hallucination. Now, where do I go in this? I have had sightings because I have dedicated myself to take pictures and something very special in the subject of UFO sightings. That has happened to me. I speak from personal experience. Ships that change their shape. They are ultra-terrestrial ships. They are not physical ships, shape-shifting ships. They can even change into angelic shapes. I've already photographed them and are going to show them here in the program. I have also taken photos of beings, of beings of beings, but not beings as they show us, of reptiles, that one thing and the other, but well-formed beings. Beings, but beings of light, that I do not see them with my eyes, but the camera detects them. And there is a phenomenon with this subject of UFOs, or extraterrestrial ships, whatever we want to call them, or the cloud of the sky, or the stars. And it is an issue, Nesta, and it is that many times you see the object and sometimes you don't see it, as if the object intelligently was programming itself for the photograph. Or it chooses who to show itself. Or it chooses who to show it and why then. It's something very... It happened to me in my house in Oriente Antioqueño. And I saw a fleet of ships raining, that is, it was raining, lightning in short, and I started to record... I do not know where that fleet came from, but I got so excited that I did not take the cell phone. But a minute later, that is, when the fleet was already in formation and was going up to the sky to hide in a cloud, but I do not know where it appeared. That is, it appeared out of nowhere, as if it was a portal or something. The fact is that this fleet of UFOs or ships or drones disappeared, it was raining, it couldn't be a drone or balloons like 
there is already an explanation, whereas there is no investigation, then they are balloons, they are drones. In short, remember that in World War II they said they are Nazi weapons, they are hot air balloons, that is, there is always an answer for that. But I saw what I saw, and I also saw, Nestor, that after the phenomenon, a helicopter of the Air Force of Rio Negro began to circle the site one hour. Why then the helicopter? But then, when we broadcasted the subject on the TV channels, they interviewed very Creole people. Well, they interviewed people who were very Creole on the subject here, and the first thing they said, they are not drones, but how come drones raining? How come it's raining balloons? To those cloud winds when it rains, to those lightning flashes, right? So the important thing is that we have the evidence and we have the material and we know what we're talking about. That is, it's an answer to tell Nestor, forgive me for being so long. But this program amazes me a lot because I find that you are a very serious investigator of the issues. You have the channel, some very interesting chapters, which also give many answers to these issues. What happens is that there is a phenomenon called pareidolia, isn't it? You see what you want to see. Suddenly you see a cloud that looks like an elephant to this person, that looks like a cat to that person, that looks like a whale to that person, to that, that person, looks like a whale like to that a whale. person. That is to say, the phenomenon of pareidolia, which is like a human perigenetic. Any person sees a humidity here. A very pious lady sees in that humidity the Virgin of Chikinkira. And ten other gentlemen come and say no. But to me, it looks like the Virgin of Carmen. To me, it looks like her. To me, it looks like her. But there are things that one cannot at any moment avoid and believe that they are a phenomenon of pareidolia. What you are telling of that fleet of clouds is not only unusual, but from a physical perspective, it is almost impossible to happen. In fact, we see that when it rains very hard, when there are storms, the same thing that happens in airports is, how can that happen? What I feel is that uh, there are two things that are terrible. One, being too gullible. Because the gullible accept everything without any judgment. And there is nothing that convinces the skeptic. And I have always thought that the principle that leads one to the truth is doubt. If you do not begin by doubting, you cannot find the truth. At least you have to grant yourself the margin of doubt to pass through the sieve of reason. Because one thing is the heart and the feeling, but another thing is also reason and neither one nor the other can cloud you. Neither everything is reason, nor everything is heart, but you have to find the right medium. And one is not stupid, one learns to distinguish what is an optical illusion from what is a real thing. In your case, it was something extremely real. I also saw a UFO once, but it doesn't happen to me because they are very special people. I talk about these issues. I've been dealing with them for many years. But if I have had a sighting, I have not had two, and I have not been. And I haven't been like checking and going out every night to look up to see if I see a UFO. No, because that also, at the moment of truth, predisposes you to see what doesn't exist, to pareidolia. If I am unprepared, anything can surprise me. But if I am already predisposed, everything I see takes me there. And it is very different from your case. Nestor, these topics are interesting. I am here excited with you. With everything that the, you tell us of the biblical astronauts, we are going to commercials, but we continue to travel to the stars with this great program. Well, we continue with the program Star Travelers and our great guest Nestor Armando Alzate, we have another topic, Nestor, and that is the Apocalypse. Let's go to the Apocalypse. John of Padmos, John the Apostle, who was also taken to heaven. That's another mystery. On the island of Patmos? On the island of Padmos, but what does John say when he was taken away? He felt a horror to see on the earth and then the darkness of space. Subject that has caused me much curiosity, the apocalypse. 
It also says that on the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the clouds of heaven will come and many stars will be seen in the sky. It is what we also saw in pandemic. In pandemic, there were many lights, there were sightings, sightings were reported. In the United States, they have been reported. There have been impressive reports and the reports have grown in an accelerated way. That you tell us about John of Padmos, John the Apostle. To begin with, let's remember that John, some argue that he is not the biblical John, the one Jesus says is my beloved disciple. Others say that he is that John, but when he reaches this stage, a very tough one already happened to him, almost as a very quick anecdote. John was about 80 something years old. And at that time he ascended to the Roman throne. Domitian of the cruel and wicked types that were, there were, and John, Domitian took him and put him in a pot of boiling oil and he came out unscathed and came out unscathed with his skin on his back. He came out of there and from there he was sent into exile. First to Ephesus and then to Padmos. In Padmos he has this vision. Some affirm that it is not specifically John but a philosophical school of thought. That the apocalypse was not written by one person. Probably John may have directed the project. Others say it was a delusion he had, which is absolutely valid. I am counting these options. Each one chooses what he believes, wants to believe. What is certain is that John is the last of the disciples. All the others precede him. And then John, with that experience that he has, and I suppose that by having, and I suppose that by having a permanent contact with the deity, I am referring to the deity of Jesus Christ. I refer to the deity in this way because I don't want to give it a religious tinge, but I want to give it a much more, much more pragmatic in the sense that who assures us that what we conceive as God or as gods are what I want to get to, are spiritual entities, superior. I think that we, and right now when we were on our way here, that Edison was telling me that, that it gave you the feeling that this, the planet Earth, was a very special planet with very special beings. Beings with whom a whole process of spiritual ascension was taking place. And I came to believe that, yes, that suddenly we are in a kind of game of, of. And that Nestor, excuse me, that all those conflicts of daily life, that all this stretch of wars and everything leads us to mature faster. I think that we are in a Nintendo game. And there are good spiritual beings and bad spiritual beings. As we were saying, in all societies, there is that confrontation and every society is dual. There is no white without black, no up without down, no right without left. And I believe that this confrontation is eternal in the whole universe. I would suggest that you read and study the book Durantia. The book Durantia talks a lot about this, this eternal struggle between good and evil. And when I am asked what I think about UFOs, at the end of the day, what I think of as UFOs are not the little dwarfs with inverted pear-shaped heads with webbed hands and feet, with almond-shaped, sprouted and slanted eyes, with a little dot on the nose. Well, no, nor the reticulian mushrooms that are beautiful and big, Nordic type, no. I don't believe in that. I think those are manifestations that are holistic. I do not believe that physical beings have come here except for the time when those 200 arrived. I don't believe that they come here. I believe that they are holistic projections. They are holograms that come to us here and that they can acquire the corporeality that they want. But I still think that those deities we are talking about are simply forces of an immeasurable power of good and evil that are in the eternal struggle between the positive and negative poles. Because the universe is dual, 
There is no entropy. Without order, nor order without entropy, that is to say with this what I want to say to end, is that definitely that this is much more than what we have been told. And that this has to lead us as human beings to understand that all the little things that happen to us are not tests, they are paths that each one of us must cover to reach what they propose, which is that one becomes a being of light. Nestor, let's conclude this program with first inviting them to your page. To invite them to your page. Nestor Armando Alzate and Logical on YouTube. Well, and I am also going to conclude with the following phrase from a cardinal who is now deceased, a close friend of John Paul II, Conrado Balducci. He used to say, even Pope John Paul used to say, always watch him when you speak on Italian television or radio. He used to say to the others, he said, the angels of the past can be the extraterrestrials of today. For sure, that's how it is. So what can we conclude, Nestor, from this great program from the astronauts of the Bible? I think we have to reevaluate a little bit this conception of UFOs as they are being handled now, of the Anunnaki, the reptilians, I don't know why. For me, all this has a spiritual background. Of course, this program does. That is, this program is culture. There are very few people who are in this context. We say goodbye, travelers, to the stars. Bye-bye.